Good evening. I think I can hear myself, so I hope you can hear me. Welcome, I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. Thanks for coming out tonight on this breezy evening. Uh, as compared to yesterday, I, we almost lost our speaker yesterday and all that wind. That was, but, but, <laughs> but he survived and uh, we're here tonight on tax day of all days to talk about public procurement and government spending. I wish I could take credit for being that clever when we scheduled this, but I, I won't. Uh, so you're in for a treat tonight. We have our colleague Jeffrey Gutman out from Brookings. And let me tell you a little bit about Jeffrey. He's a senior fellow in global economy and development at Brookings, where he focuses on infrastructure and urban development, as well as larger issues of global development. He comes to Brookings after a long distinguished career at the World Bank, so he has an informed global view of this topic. And he, he's also worked as an economist and planner for consulting firms. He's been a consultant to the US Congress National Transportation Policy Study. So we've had conversations this week about transportation with him. He's obviously been in economics classes and political science classes, meeting with honors college faculty, getting the introduction to UNLV. He's not a first time visitor to Las Vegas, but it, it's been a while, so he's noticed a change or two. And uh, Jeffrey's degree is from Rutgers University uh, in labor relations from Cornell University. And he's lectured and spoken on this topic all over the world. So we're gonna get a, uh, tonight here his words and your questions, hopefully at, at the end. and talk about a very important topic on which we, we may be more used to thinking about on a local government or state government level, but think about it tonight on the federal government level and on an international level, as you'll hear from Jeffrey. Thank you, Bill. <coughs> Thank you. It's, it's really a pleasure. Last time I was in Las Vegas was high school, actually. So <laughs> it, it, was, it was a little different in those days. and. Uh, I really appreciate everybody coming out. Public procurement is not the sexiest topic, so I really appreciate coming, coming because for me, and I'm not a procurement expert or professional, I'm basically a development practitioner, uh, but I do believe very strongly that procurement is one of the key instruments that we have as a strategic policy instrument that we use to actually implement what we wanna do in terms of public policy, in terms of purchase of goods. When you wanna get something done, you need to know about public procurement. But it's also probably one of the professions that people are the most cynical about. As much cynicism as there is about government, there's a lot of cynicism about, even more cynicism about procurement and government procurement moreover. Uh, so you heard a little bit about my background and my procurement knowledge is more about what I do with developing countries, which even is more challenging than the, uh, than the federal government or local government. But I think a lot of the examples I use, sometimes I'll be working through issues of the federal government, sometimes international, but I am going to give you a, a perspective from the World Bank as to how public procurement, for example, has opened up markets around the world and what's happened to that over time. Now, this is a crucial time in terms of public procurement because there are reforms going on all over the world. For years, public procurement kind of went in its own way, but now there are reforms at the UN, there's reforms at the EU, forms of the federal government. And at the WTO, it's probably the most active element, the only one that's moving on the WTO, is the WTO General Procurement Agreement, which many countries are signing up in order to have some clarification of bilateral relations of how they can do business with each other in terms of procurement. So the US is in there, Canada, mostly developed countries. Developing countries don't have the systems in place often to qualify. But for example, the Chinese are trying to find a way to enter into the agreement. So when you look at world trade, it's actually quite striking what's going on, and this is a key time. For development institutions, and I'll talk a lot, um, I'll give some background on the World Bank because I think it's important as background to what I'm going to show. In the development institutions, they've had the same policy since the 1950s with little tweaks here and there, and now, so many years later, they're in the process of doing a major revamp of their policies. The World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Bank, they're all looking to redo how they do procurement. And I'm gonna come to the main issue as to why, and we'll talk about that. Um, 
part, well, let me, let me give you some reasons to start. One reason for the reforms is that the modes of how you do procurement, as opposed to just getting a bid, taking the lowest bid, and, and figuring out the lowest price and just awarding it, there are all different types of procurement now. There's e-procurement, there are reverse auctions. I'm not gonna go into each of these and, and bore you with them, but they change the nature of how we do business in procurement because of the nature of procurement being very different, whether it's IT or it's infrastructure or it's pharmaceuticals or it's pencils. It's all very different. So that reform, those reforms are changing the nature of how you do business. The second set is that they're using public procurement for other purposes, what we call horizontal objectives. So there's green procurement, so that you take into account carbon footprint or other issues when you're doing procurement. There's social issues, women-owned businesses, or disadvantaged minorities in certain countries. Uh, so people are using procurement in order to be able to push those objectives. And uh, finally, small and medium enterprises to be able to protect those enterprises. So it's, it's really become extremely complex. And what I'm hoping to show, I'm, those three points that I'm hoping to make, one is that public procurement is more than just uh, plumbing and wiring that you leave to the procurement experts, which is normally the way we think about it, almost the way we think about our car if, if you don't know how, how the engine runs. But I'm going to try to emphasize how much of a public policy instrument it is and how important it is for everybody to focus on it. I am going to use examples about how it's opened worldwide markets, but it goes, we'll go beyond that. But in doing the debate in all these reforms, there are two, there's one big debate and two sides to it. One is a push for more compliance, a worry about corruption and wanting to have more rules. On the other side is a push for more discretion, professional flexibility. This is a major debate with major trade-offs and it goes to the basic issue of governance, the two angles of governance. One being, we might think of it in terms of integrity and anti-corruption, but the other side is making sure basic services or government services actually get delivered in the quality and at the price you want. And those two don't always mesh. And the debate is quite, we'll get into that debate. And that's those three points I'm hoping to make. Let me give you some background. Whoops, before that. Uh, how big is public procurement? Well, first of all, public procurement is the acquisition of goods, services, works to external, from external sources by public government. It's about 15 to 20 percent of GDP. It is big business. And this is around the world. This is not just the United States. In other countries, it could be even higher. Some developing countries, lower. U.S. federal level, here I have 500 billion. Somebody showed me a number of 1 trillion. I think it depends whether you include local governments, because local governments uh, in the OECD, actually, when you take out defense spending, there's more public procurement going on by local governments, by state and city governments, uh, than going on at the federal level. And obviously with the challenges institutionally involved in that. World Bank, seven billion about a year, 100,000 contracts a year, just to give you uh, that kind of information as to what's out there. Um, actually, Stephen Coltai had a quote uh, a few years ago. He was the former manager of the State Department's Global Entrepreneurship Program. And he said, the US government is by many orders of magnitude the largest shopper in the American economy. And that's probably very true, so this is quite important. But he also said people avoid government procurement and participate in government procurement because they don't want to be the mouse that has to dance with the hippo. So I would have liked to hear more about that. Um, let me just give you some background on procurement. You have the pretendering basically putting together your specifications of what it is you want. You have the tender, the invitation to bid, and the award on the basis of criteria that you set forth. And then you have the contract, the post-award phase. So you have the upstream, the bid and award, and the downstream. And the bid and award is what most people focus on. I'm gonna come back to that a lot because to me it's the weakness in terms of the argument. But I also say that we're all procurement experts. Every one of us is a shopper, we procure. So if we're going to be doing a, a kitchen remodeling, God forbid, um, <laughs> we first go out and determine, okay, what kind of appliances do we want? How do we design? We do all the upstream, upstream pretendering. We then figure out, okay, who am I gonna invite to bid? I gotta call Joe, Sally, my mother, everybody else to figure out which contractors I should be inviting to bid and let them bid. 
and then I get the bids back, and I look at it, and the lowest bid I look at, well, it's interesting, but that guy seemed really sleazy. So I'm gonna give it to my brother-in-law, because at least I know where he lives. <laughs> and then I monitor what happens to make sure my brother-in-law actually did the contract right. So that's private procurement. Public procurement, you get the same upstream, you're determining your specs. When you get to the tendering itself, you actually have rules about who you can invite and who you can't invite, and under what circumstances you're going to evaluate. And you can't hire your brother-in-law, or let alone the mayor's brother-in-law. You actually have to be very careful about who you hire. And then hopefully somebody is watching what happens at the end. So I mean, the difference is mainly, it's not your money when you're doing public procurement, it's someone else's money. And so that, that's quite important. And welcome to public procurement. Now, I am gonna talk about procurement and aid financing because that's the, the biggest part of what I've been working on. World Bank projects, you identify investments. If, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the World Bank, but basically it loans money to developing countries to be able to invest in roads, dams, education, policy reforms, and there's a lot of procurement in that. And basically, work with the government, you identify the road that you, they wanna build, you appraise it to make sure it's feasible, you negotiate a loan, you get the engineering done, the country puts out a tender following the World Bank's guidelines and rules. That's basic policy in, in the development institutions. And then, but the contract is between the government, the government and the contractor, the World Bank is not party to the contract, but then the World Bank monitors. I just put that out there because you have to understand where some of my issues are coming because of the next set of issues I'm gonna show you. The principles of procurement for the World Bank, and they're probably similar worldwide. Economy and efficiency, equal opportunity to compete, domestic contracting, this was a World Bank thing because it's a development institution, but you can see the same in the United States with promoting small and medium enterprises or certain disadvantaged portions of the population, and transparency. What you will note is that most of this is related to tender and award. That's the focus. And that's gonna be a weakness that we'll talk about when we try to figure out. At the World Bank, you have two types of bidding. You have international competitive bidding. That means it's a large enough project. It's complex enough. You gotta invite and open it to everybody in the world. Or you have national competitive bidding. Those are small works, roads, uh, culverts, little schools that no international firm is gonna be interested in. That's taken care of with national documents in the national language with usually national contractors. So we're gonna focus on ICB. So there are 100,000 contracts a year, only 2,000 are done with what we call ICB, but those 2,000 contracts make up the multitude or the biggest proportion of the lending that a World Bank or an African bank or the development institutions do. It's a little different when you're dealing with the government, with the public, with the US government as such, it will be reserved probably for American companies in many cases. Um, and one of the major project ideas of the ICB, it was 1951, it was actually a General Wheeler who actually introduced it into the bank. And the idea was not necessarily to develop a worldwide market. The issue was to make sure we get the best quality contractor out there or goods and that it's delivered at the best possible price. And you had to do that by opening up competition. And so ICB was very much what was done in 1951 and has not changed at the World Bank in 70 years. Uh, but what did happen was unexpected, is that there was a development of a worldwide market that actually the global influence of having that contract expanded the markets worldwide and in a way that actually is quite beneficial and quite contribution to globalization. And this was a secondary purpose and actually, in, in some ways, it was also to give benefit to the contractors in the countries that contributed to development, to the development banks. So for the World Bank, for anybody to be able to go to Congress and to try to promote aid financing, they would say, we get it back because we get contracts through ICB. And used, every year we would be reporting to Congress about how many contracts the US won and how much money. Now you're gonna see that that's changed over time and causes a problem and Congress isn't very happy. This is the top 10 suppliers in foreign procurement. 
by the value of contracts, not the number of contracts. So these are ICB contracts for goods and works. I can't remember if this included, probably includes services. You can see in the 1980s, it's all OECD countries plus Korea. They were the top 10. That was the 1980s. You look at 1995, US is still up there, Japan's still up there, a lot of Europe, suddenly China. You come to 2005, now China's on the top. Actually, in that year, there was, the US wasn't in the top 10. You even had Saudi Arabia. Sometimes it's a problem. India comes in. That's one to watch. Sometimes it's a matter of a specific contract that they got that was very big that you see a country in there that seems odd. 2013, most recently, China up there, India up there, US was there at that time. And what you're seeing is a major change. That's in terms of value. If I took it in terms of number of contracts for goods and works, let's watch this. This is 1995, not by value, but number of internationally bid contracts. And look at the US in 1995, pretty big. Actually, Latin America was pretty big. Mexico was pretty big. China, Japan, India, Europe. OK, watch that carefully. That's 2013. So when you look at the number of internationally bid contracts, the world market has changed dramatically in aid financing. That the OECD, OECD countries are less capable of competing, and local industries are growing. You have China growing, Southeast Asia, India still, Africa. Uh, this is actually Central America. But US now shrank. I mean, I'll go back again. Take a look, and then watch it disappear. It's an incredible, I mean, it's, it's not a great news for the US, but it's absolutely fantastic news for the world in terms of markets developing. And what's happening is actually an economic development principle, which was actually surprising. The stages of development, you first had, you, if you look especially at the civil works industry, first industry to develop in a developing country would be the construction industry and civil engineering. Basic, because they have a lot of construction going on. So they actually start by getting contracts to serve local markets. They don't get World Bank contracts or ICB contracts. Then they, get, they start competing on the international level within their own country. Then they compete regionally for regional contracts. And then if they're really strong, they compete globally. And we see this over and over again. We see in Latin America, you saw Brazil, Mexico, and major contractors from them become international. Uh, now you see China and India. And if you look at China's evolution, in 1995, though it showed up high there, most of its contracts that it was winning were inside China. They were winning ICB contracts given by the World Bank. They were able to compete and win inside almost 100% of the contracts in civil works. When you look into 2013, you start seeing that they still win all the contracts inside their country, but now they're winning even more outside the country, and they're developing into a global power. Now, you can, this is actually a great measure of how development is going on. And what this shows you is, in civil works, procurement and aid financing, ICB, in East Asia and the Pacific, 97% of the contracts of the World Bank for Civil Works International are won by regional or local companies, 97%. Europe and Central Asia should be 93%. These are developing country. Uh, we don't include developed countries in, in Europe in terms of serving. Latin America, 91%. Middle East, North Africa fluctuates because they don't have a lot of contracts. South Asia, about 83 But look at Africa, 56%. And it's an interesting story, why? Why is Africa not developing? It's something there's not been a lot of research on. We're starting to look into it, whether the construction industry just isn't developing, or is it that they're up against competition that the other regions weren't up against during their stat stage of development? And that's basically China and most recently India. That so you see China and India winning, winning civil works contracts in Africa. The model I could go into, but I, I think that would take me long and take me uh, 
beyond where, where I want to be today. But if you have questions, uh, I can tell you more about how that's evolving. I don't want to be xenophobic or Chinophobic on that. It's, it's just that's the way it's actually developing. We're a small group, so if you have a question, actually, you can interrupt me, please, since everybody's in the cheap seats and nobody's in the expensive seats. Um, so now we talk about reform and the reforms that are coming. And what is the major issue in doing those reforms? It's the issue of compliance versus discretion. It's actually not a new debate. We saw it in the 1980s and 1990s in the US. What's going on? How can we make this work? And it's the trade-off in the governance issues of integrity on the one side and whether you get the best quality on the other. And the arguments are what we're going to go through. So corruption is really a major issue for procurement around the world. It is just the fact. And so there's a stylized formula that came out of uh, Klitgard. And he says, corruption is equal to monopoly plus discretion minus accountability. And basically what he's saying, if you look at tender and award, what do we do? We took away the monopoly by making a competitive bid. Everybody is able to bid, make the ground even. Discretion we took away by putting in rules and making very clear how you get from A to C and how a decision is made. And we took care of accountability by making it very transparent. At least we try to make it very transparent. I know at the local level sometimes that's not so easy. Um, so that's the stylized formula, and it's mainly about the tender and the award. So we get to the argument, and this is, I'm not sure where everybody would be on the balance. If I asked you right now whether you're a compliance-oriented person or a discretion-oriented person when it comes to government procurement, I'm not sure what kind of answers. And when I go through this, this both debates, it'd be interesting to hear. Um, the compliance people basically argue that the clarity of process and criteria is essential for procurement, public procurement to work and be effective. Otherwise, people won't bid, people won't participate. The worldwide perception of substantial corruption is serious. There's an EU report on corruption and an OECD report, both from last year. Let me see if I can find the statistics over here. So for the EU report, it was a commission of the European Parliament, EU anti-corruption. It says public procurement is one of the areas most vulnerable to corruption, especially infrastructure and construction. 32% of the companies that they interviewed say corruption prevented them from winning a contract, especially uh, in construction. It's really incredible. The OECD just came out with a foreign bribery report, an analysis of crime and bribery of foreign public officials, 2014. And of the cases they looked at, 57% were public procurement cases. That's really disconcerting. If you want to have cynic cynicism in government, this, this will really give it to you. We've had big cases, very major cases around the world. We've had Siemens in 2006, where they were caught with institutionalized bribing of officials, basically a, a whole apparatus within the, the corporation. I should say and give credit to Siemens, they wiped out the top management changed everybody and changed, became a major factor actually in the anti-corruption movement following their findings by the Germans. Uh, and some of those projects were World Bank projects, by the way. Um, and more recently, in 2014, Alstom, a French uh, company, uh, industrial giant in energy and transportation, they were quite doing the same thing. They had institutionalized corruption. The thing is to find it and be able to, and then, so they paid a significant fine to the US and probably still more to come. And if you go to Montreal, I don't know if you're aware of it, there's an enormous scandal in Montreal on roads construction uh, that's being investigated by the um, Carboneau Commission, uh, Charbonneau Commission, excuse me, since 2011. Basically, the mafia, the construction companies, the, the public officials, uh, three mayors resigned, uh, all were involved in a scam in terms of collusion, fixing contracts, uh, making sure this one won the bid and another one didn't win the bid. Um, if one contractor tried to uh, break out, there was violence and threats. And this has all come out. It's, it's an enormous scandal. Um, I come from New Jersey. 
So, you know, nothing new. So, yeah, you know, like I say, so it, when you listen to this, and then you look at developing countries and the situation they're in with weak institutions, you know, no, you know, basic judicial system to be able to follow up or contracts, um, it's even weaker. You, you start saying, whoa, we need rules. We need compliance. We need something to stop this corruption. And basically what you have now at the World Bank, and, and the development institutions did not use the word corruption until the late 1990s. It was actually uh, Wolfensohn who finally went to Indonesia, which was the most flagrant at that time, and talked about corruption and put it on the table and then started a whole business over the last 15 years of trying to take out corruption. But unfortunately, he used the word zero tolerance, which is a tough word in the development field because when you're going into risky countries, which is what the World Bank does, and you say zero tolerance, it has a uh, dampening effect on doing anything. So this is basically the argument. Um, and actually, what the other thing that we observe is that the developing countries themselves, even more than the banking institutions, are more compliance-oriented than the banks themselves. I mean, if you look in India, the ministers have, been, have lost over the last few years, have lost their ability to have discretion in procurement for any reason. They, the smallest reasons, they, they can't have to be compliant, absolutely compliant, because everyone's nervous, everyone's scared, everyone wants to bring back some amount, reduce the cynicism in government. So this is the argument, and it's a worldwide argument. It's not just in developing countries. And it is the argument that is for compliance and rules. And then you have the case for discretion. How can you bring and allow professional discretion? If you exclude professional judgment in making some decisions, imagine doing your kitchen if you didn't have that discretion that somebody outside wrote the rules, told you what to do, you had to take this contractor. Yeah, he had some history of a bad performance. You can't take that into account because that's not in our rules. I mean, this actually changes the whole nature of the debate. So the people for discretion are saying, we're losing the quality of what we do because we're focused too much on compliance. We're not looking at what is the best way to do things. And we've actually given too much of a role to the contract officer. Contract officer, the procurement expert, is the person that manages the tender and award manager. It is the person who knows the rules. They make their living by knowing the rules. And I don't want to denigrate, I, I really have great respect, they're in tough places. But when you leave it to the contract officer, the incentives are about compliance. They're not about the ultimate output of what comes in and the quality. Um, it also leads to a risk-averse culture, because you don't get awarded for going outside the box, rewarded, excuse me, um, and you have major risk aversion in procurement. I mean, even in countries like Colombia, if I understand correctly, they have personal liability, a procurement officer, so that I can go after him professionally. They can go after his bank account for his personally if someone made a mistake on his team. So what do you do? You don't make decisions, and that's what's happening around the world. Innovation and creative solutions. S compliance rules basically assume everything is there. The rule book, the uh, federal government has the Federal Acquisition Regulation, or FAR. It's 744 pages, plus thousands of pages of supplemental rules. Imagine trying to do, I'm talking about the hippo. Um, but in innovation, if you look at the private sector, Look at GE, just a chief economist was speaking a few weeks ago at a conference on innovation and saying they did a crowdsourcing initiative to find out who could design the, the most lightweight part that connects the wing to the engine. And they just crowdsourced it rather than just giving it to their aerospace engineers. And it ended up, be, ended up being an Indonesian engineer who won. This guy would have never been invited under normal rules, under government rules, wouldn't have qualified. But this was a person that actually found a way to make it 80% lighter than the aerospace engineers. And we have several examples of that. But the public sector has a harder time working outside the box and doing things like that. And it's actually what has raised this issue of discretion and the failure of policy is specific to one industry, 
IT. That's where actually people started realizing that when we try to apply all these rules from infrastructure and others to IT, it just doesn't work. We basically have gotten really bad results. You might put Obamacare and the website on, on that, and there's a lot of writing about it too, that part of the problem was the procurement. Part of the problem is also in the upstream, the planning of the tender. If you don't know what you want, no contractor is going to really succeed. If you keep changing things, your kitchen story would be the same thing. Um, and what people are looking for, even industry now, is looking to be able to bid on value for money as opposed to price only criteria. They want to be able to put in order to compete around the world. When you see the US companies failing to compete on price, they do believe they could compete on quality if quality came into the equation. If you're Medtronics and you're trying to export health machinery and health goods, um, you want to be able to bring into the specification some measure of the quality, relative quality versus what you might find from other countries. But it's not necessarily taken into account. And so there's a lot of push by industry now to reform procurement to allow much more flexibility in terms of value for money. And finally, horizontal objectives. People now want to take into account all kinds of objectives, environment, social, uh, other kinds of, of issues worldwide which require a little more subjective analysis. You can't, you have to give points to different um, objectives and put that in. It's not just for price. So these are the people that are arguing for more discretion. So let me go to what I think, how I see it. I'm not sure which, which way you face now is by show of hands, how many people are compliance and how many people are discretion oriented? Compliance oriented? Yeah, we got compliance here. The more expensive seats, the more compliant. We got one over there. Discretion? Unknown? Okay. My feeling is a balance. It's, 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 it shows you the debate is pretty, uh, pretty intense. My feeling is they both missed the point. And let me explain it because of the way people look at procurement. And I'm going to come to that. So I'm going to give you about four points that I think come together to try to give a different way to look at public procurement and public procurement reform. First, I'm looking at development effectiveness. It could be the effectiveness of the investment. What we want to look at is what are we trying to get? What's the result? What's the outcome? What we usually measure, what procurement people usually measure, is how many bidders there were, what was the price, how many days did it take. These are all process oriented. What they miss is what happened at the end of the stream? Did we get the best possible good? Was it a failure? Did we get suboptimal? I think uh, probably the most likely is we get suboptimal. And what's interesting is when the World Bank did consultations on reform around the world, and the issues that were raised, the number one issue over here, which you probably can't see, is delays and responsiveness. That was what was on people's minds. Whoops. But number, the last issue that nobody, almost nobody raised, development effectiveness and impact, the quality of the outcome. So if the focus is on final outcomes, then the focus must be on the whole procurement cycle from design to bid and award to contract management and implementation. And, but as I was saying before, when we talked about this, most of the policies are all about tendering and price. Now there's a reason for that. The reason for that is who is the constituency? The constituency are the contractors, the private industry. They want to make sure this is done in a way that they can live with. So they look at this. They don't look at what happens at the very end. And that's really where we miss the boat because we have to look at the whole process. And most procurement people believe that their job is done when the contract is signed. And we're going to come to that more as to what happened in post-award, what happened in pre-tendering, especially when we talk about corruption. So looking at the whole procurement cycle and the corruption model, we need to identify the risks at each stage. Not only the risks, but the cost at each stage of trying to address it. And most people who have looked at it argue that the cost of eliminating corruption in the tendering process, if you want to go further than we are, if you want to go to zero tolerance, is beyond the benefits you would get. 
Where is the shoe pinching in terms of corruption? Is it at the pretendering? Is it at the tender? Or is it contract? And when we go back to the model here, we've already talked about how in tendering we've done as much as we can with monopoly, discretion, and accountability through the systems. But when we go to once it's implemented, think about it. Once the contract is awarded, you have a monopoly, an absolute monopoly. The contractor has you. I mean, even when you're doing your kitchen, the contractor has you. You have discretion because, frankly, not a lot of people are watching or know what's going on when the contractor is working. In your own home, you might be a little more observant. I can tell you in international development, there isn't much going on in watching. And in accountability, sometimes it'll be years before you find out what actually happened when the bridge falls um, and when somebody really finds out. The examples of corruption that I bring out most from development, one is anti, the global fund got into trouble. The anti-malarial bed nets that they were delivering to countries were not treated with anti-malarial mal malarial insecticide. They went untreated through bribes. That was during implementation. You had, uh, let me see if I can find my other examples here. We had a major issue in the World Bank of India Health where facilities, you have small facilities all over the country. They weren't built or they were built substandard or equipment was out there that wasn't working. The tender was fine, but the delivery was tainted. Um, rural, I have a rural water supply uh, problem in one country where there was Japanese money doing rural water supply and there was World Bank money. But the Japanese were monitoring and measuring the length of pipe that was delivered for their wells and the World Bank was managing and monitoring the number of wells. And what happened? Someone got the bright idea. Let's put Japanese pipes in the World Bank wells and have a shadow ghost shipment of pipes that we just pocket the money and nobody would know. Actually, there was an auditor that found out and, and picked it up, mostly because they made a stupid mistake of having the trucks that were delivering the pipes all from, from like 100 miles coming within an hour with all the pipes for 10 different loads, so it was obvious that they had screwed it up. If they were more sophisticated, it would have, would have gone. Um, but that's the impact on the final product, I mean, in roads, it's very notorious. Roads, it's very easy. You short the materials, you bribe the supervisor. But what is important is that when you have corruption at the end at contract and the contract implementation, it has a major impact on the benefits of the project. When you have bribery at the tender and award, yeah, ethically it's wrong. But the question is whether it's going to actually affect the benefits of the project as much as what happens during contract management. What you have going on during the tender and award, and I may be beaten up for this, what you have going on is somebody trying to get the contract. Not that they're gonna do a bad job, but they'll do anything to get the contract. And they pay money to do it. But it doesn't mean that they're gonna have corruption, that they're gonna, it is corrupt. They're gonna actually sacrifice quality at the end. It may be a higher price. It may cause the contractor, because he has to share so much money that he shorts the material. That's a different issue. But the issue is where does the shoe really pinch? You know, where do you need to actually focus more? Where do you need to identify the risk and then address that more specifically? And my feeling is you have to look at the whole and apply this model and look at where you need to actually define where you might have more discretion you might allow more discretion in tendering an award and pretender, and you might want more compliance on the contract management, but it's probably the area that gets the least amount of attention. And it's a real problem for development, and it's where we lose most of the money involved in, in civil works and goods. Go ahead. I don't want to take you off from too much of a, uh, a tangent. I think you make a great point about your, you know, let's focus on a good delivered product. That's what you're talking about. But you're also talking about the developing world, or maybe the undeveloped world. And those countries don't necessarily all have the qualified people, per se, 
to actually monitor and ensure that the quality of the product is what, what's expected. Let, let's talk about a road, for instance. Mm -hmm. Do these people really know that the road has to be four inches versus the, the, the deliverer, the contractor, is only putting in a one and a half inch? And do uh, they know how to test for that? Yeah, actually, that's a very good question, and it's actually my next paper. Um, so if you come to the next lecture. My argument is that the developing institutions have actually lost the focus on contract implementation. If you're in the World Bank and you have a project, you supervise the project. You go out and check whether the project is doing what it's supposed to do. In addition to the supervisory engineer that's hired to oversee it, as well as allowing civil society to have information to monitor projects like local community development driven projects. There are different ways to monitor, but you're right. The issue is the technical side. And that is a problem because the, the World Bank used to be more of an engineering institution. It's the point I made actually in the class. It was full of engineers. I had 19 highway engineers in the 1980s in Latin America transport department. Today there's one and a half because basically we're now looking more at environment and social and finance and institutions. And the engineers, we depend on the countries themselves. And actually, countries themselves have some good engineers. I can tell you, even in a place like uh, DRC in the Congo, I've met some of the best pavement engineers around. Really, some of these engineers, they, they know how to make something out of absolutely nothing. But they gotta be out there, they have to have an incentive, you have to have monitoring, you have to have technical audits, you have to have a process. You have to have a means of compliance, and I agree with you, you have to have the capability to ensure compliance. Um, but it, that is an issue, and it's something we're actually talking about. Uh, and let me go to my fourth point, and my last point, I'm right on time, wow, is that the key factor in ensuring credible use of discretion is for public policy professionals to better understand procurement as a public policy strategy instrument. My feeling is we leave everything to the procurement folk. And that this is much more than procurement. This is way broader than procurement. Yet, in our public policy classes, no matter where you go, even in our business schools, very few focus, if any, on procurement. You'll get accounting, you'll get some other elements of public expenditure, but you won't get a sensitization on procurement and how it works. And I can tell you, if you get into public policy and you get into government or related to that, this is the thing that's gonna bite you. This is where you're gonna go wrong. This is where you're gonna fall because it is key to actually getting the results you want. And with that, that's where the reforms are going. We'll see how it comes out. Obviously, this is something that's gone on for years. I think there are a lot of good examples of where things are going uh, and there are still challenges. I, mean, I was reading uh, Easterly's writings and he's kind of arguing, well, poorer countries have more corruption. And my argument is no, I don't think they have more corruption. They obviously can't afford even a small amount of corruption, but it doesn't mean they have more. They may have more unsophisticated um, corruption, which is easy to catch, but the higher the education level, you know, and the more sophisticated the economy, the more sophisticated the corruption. And uh, I'll leave you with that cynical thought and open up for questions. Go ahead. Have accountability, compliance, transparency in societies where corruption is an integral part of those societies, whether it's the Middle East, parts of Africa, waste disposal in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's, it's part of the society. How can you change the society or even yeah. have a form of compliance? Yeah, I think it's actually, I was talking about that with Jeff Butler today, is what you do in different communities. Uh, it's, it's an interesting topic, and part of it is one of the strategies. For example, in Indonesia, during the height of uh, corruption, the World Bank would not lend. It couldn't trust that the money would get spent where it was supposed to be, and so it pulled out of most of its investment. But it did do one type of investment, that was community-driven development. It would work with the communities, it would put transparent, you would have a board in the, in the middle of the square that said, we're building this, it cost this much, this is the contractor, and the community itself was actually managing. Yes, you had failures, and if they failed, they basically lost money in the next round. But it actually led to a lot of education, and it does show that if the information is out there, and it's accessible, and it's facilitated, you actually have a better chance and you start building the anti-corruption uh, movement. 
And then you need a press. You need a free press that actually goes after it and is able to report on it. Obviously, you need political. Um, if you look ultimately in, in Indonesia, KPK, the anti-corruption uh, group that grew up uh, under the new regime, actually went after major uh, corruption uh, cases involving officials. You have the Scorpions in South Africa, very noteworthy. Actually, the former head of Scorpions is now the head of integrity at the World Bank. And uh, so, I, you know, it's communities, and there's a lot more NGOs out there and organizations that if you work with them, they actually can do things on this. The issue is for large investment, dams, big roads. Uh, Transparency International is doing a lot of work on this. Uh, through its construction uh, sector transparency initiative, but it's, it's a long road. I'm working with a group that's trying to promote uh, publication of public sector contracts, because it's normally not published, and private sector doesn't want to get ahead of it. Yes, in, in the United States and some other places, freedom of information, you can try to ask. What you won't find out, and what nobody puts up, is the change orders. The price changes, the value changes, you don't find that, you don't know they happened, and they're usually not posted. I don't know how it is in the U.S., but I know in developing countries, <laughs> you don't have that. I would say from a contractor standpoint, this is exactly what you look at. In yeah. the specification, you find the weaknesses that gives you later on possibilities to go and generate and say changes that cause cost uprights. Yeah. Uh, you, can get a, you can get a project very cheap and still in the end make money on it. Yeah. It's, uh, Actually, that's a, a and question. Just, and that is not necessarily then bribery. So that's the other big part of it, besides bribery. Um, how do you mean? Explain corruption, you mean. corruption is a second issue with it. Uh, if you have a weekly specified, oh, right. if yes. you have a weekly specified project, uh, you from the contractor side you see where the opportunities are. Yeah, actually, there's a study out on Africa, Tanzania in particular, by a woman named Jill Wells who's part of a small NGO called Engineers Against Poverty in London. And she goes out and actually documents these things. Her argument is, uh, where I was focusing on the downstream, she says really the problem's on the upstream. And the problem is in major construction dams, things, there's going to be changes because nobody knows up front exactly how it's going to evolve. Um, but also, the designs, the engineering is sometimes problematic. This raises another question on discretion. Normally, the rule is, that you can't have a direct relationship with a contractor when you're the procurement person or the technical person before they put in their, their tender. You can have them in a meeting, you can talk to them in that way, but you can't do it off one by one. And in order to do the design, some of these things are very technical and the government doesn't have the capability, even in the US, to do it. So they have to hire somebody to do that. But if they hire somebody, then they have a conflict of interest and they can't bid on the contract. So you hire somebody who has no interest in bidding on the contract. Well, that may be somebody who actually has no business in the business anyway. So you, know, you have to be able to engage with a contractor and understand the market and have the technical people, but you gotta do it in a way that's transparent and open. Or a lot of people, a lot of ways we do things is invite, based on specifications, invite alternative designs, but then you have to be able to judge those designs. Um, I'm covering a lot of territory in a very short time, so it's a, um, but it is, a, my push is that more public policy people get backgrounds. It's sense you don't have to be a procurement expert or a contract manager, but I think it's really important to know what the business is about. Um, and on tax day, there couldn't be a better, better thing to talk about. Um, but it's a long way to go, because I can tell you all the public policy programs I know have no, curriculum to be able to explain this kind of thing of how you do it. And there's an issue in consultants. That's a whole other business of how you hire consultants and how you monitor consultants. But um, that'll be another paper. Yeah, um, I'd be really curious, uh, on the downstream side, uh, is there any attention paid to what efficiency is built into uh, whatever infrastructure piece might be put in there, whether it's a dam or a road? for a return of investment for the community as a whole, uh, you know, uh, above and beyond the, the yeah. initial commerce that's created and so forth? I, I mean, I've seen that. Actually, I've seen that here. Um, well, yeah, like, 
So the Nevada Strong, we've been addressing, you know, how yeah, can we get five dollars back from if, a dollar in? If they come in under or they come in earlier, can you get money back for the? Uh, can you share the the profit? Um, I've seen that on roads. Um, there is another way to do things is on the basis of result. You don't pay until you get the results. Um, Result-based contracts, so contract maintenance of roads. Basically, what you contract out is the standard and specification, and if they reach that, they get paid so much per kilometer. Um, and that was done in Argentina. I remember the first bidder that did it, you know, bid low, got the contract. Probably, I don't, I'm, you know, this is being taped. Um, probably lost his shirt, and he didn't bid. The next time he bid higher, and someone else, you know, unfortunately got the lower value contract. Um, I, I think there are a lot of changes. I think this is part in the discretion of how you can share with the community, for example. But the issue is you want to get the lowest price. You don't want to get, uh, you know, an issue that is built into price. One problem we have is negotiation. In the World Bank, what you're not allowed to do is negotiate with the winning bidder once he wins the, the award. Um, you know, I can go to a country and the minister will say to me, look, I know there's collusion. I can't put my finger on it. I can't prove it, but I know there's collusion. So I want to negotiate with this rascal once he gets the contract to get the price down to where I think it should be. And we say, well, you know, if you keep doing that, it just gets built into the price of the contracts because everyone knows they're going to be nickel and dime down to the, so usually you try to make sure the competition is straight. And there are a lot of issues and a lot of territory to go. Dams is, is really a tough, that's, that's a broader set of issues uh, that I could go into. But, um, I mean, it, you have a range dealing with pencils versus textbooks versus pharmaceuticals versus roads versus dams versus IT. Each one has a different market, a different nature of how to do business, and it requires actually expertise in that field with an expertise in procurement in order to get it right, using some lessons, some, some other values that you can do. But that's, um, that's the challenge. Uh, okay. Um, Do you I mean, have uh, the experts in these various areas? It's interesting. The World Bank, for example, has technical staff in these areas and then it has procurement staff. Once procurement became very compliance oriented and everybody felt risk averse, the one thing that the technical people didn't want was to be accredited as a procurement expert. Um, they didn't want to have to deal with procurement. They were scared of it. Um, and it's something actually we're wrestling with. Not only public policy people need to be engaged, but the technical people need to be trained, sensitive on procurement. Engineers, yeah, they know procurement. Usually the engineer was the procurement officer in the bank if you were doing a highway. But if you're a doctor doing medicines and pharmaceuticals, they had no clue what was going on in the market. And so, how you get those groups sensitized to realize that they have to be part of it. If you're setting up the specifications for medical equipment, for MRIs or whatever to send to Honduras, you, know, you better have your, your stuff together. But it is, that is a challenge, is getting people to realize this is part and parcel. And when I came into the bank, which was back in the late 70s, early 80s, we had to be trained. It was a favorite course, was to be trained in procurement, first of all, because you heard all the stories of what went wrong. And then you got scared to death. But you know, we were trained. It's not happening now. <coughs> yes. This is more, more of a global question. But uh, the the, uh, the Chinese in creating this new uh, entity, uh, the, uh, in, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, yeah, AIB. Yeah, yeah. How do you see uh, that uh, say competing with the world? Well, Bank? Let, let me give you a, a, a true story. It's when we went to the Chinese at the World Bank and said, "What did you benefit from most?" during the first, I think it was 20 years of lending and relationship. And we went around to all the provinces and the federal government agencies. Number one, the only thing that was consistent across the whole country, procurement, public procurement and procurement rules and how it functions. And, and they've actually made very good use of it actually very, very effectively. Um, so it's, you know, I, I, so there is an appreciation, but I, I think the biggest, the biggest problem is when you do bilateral, whether it's the US, Japan, or whatever, Korea, you know, you had reserve procurement. Your, only your companies could apply to be able to get money, the investment, to bid on the investment for 
bilateral funding. So the Chinese have been very effective in Africa at actually putting a lot of money into African infrastructure. They have incredible companies that do roads, hydropower, railways. So they won those bids because they were all national reserved. They get on the ground with good credit from China, from machinery. Once they're on the ground and established, then they're very effective at bidding on World Bank contracts and others. It's an incredible strategy and very, very successful one. The Indians are doing the same. Um, so I, now for the new bank, you know, the respect they've given to international bidding, I would imagine they're going to want the same. I mean, they've always been big proponents. When we talk about compliance versus discretion and reforms, I can tell you at the World Bank, they've been very strong supporters of procurement policy as it is compliance. So, um, you know, I, I think it's the big question whether all the lessons learned and the rules and safeguards and things like that will be followed by the Chinese in the Asian Infrastructure Bank. My feeling is yes, but perhaps with a twist, there may be some changes, but there were a lot of lessons learned over the years and we hope that, I mean, I welcome the bank and I think it's a very important investment. Infrastructure, you can spend money till doomsday. I think it's good to have more the merrier, but I think standards, norms, are going to be important to be able to make sure the money is spent right. Um, now, what, what detail are projects generally uh, funded through the World Bank? Or, or in other words, uh, are projects ever defined in a more general way like a transportation system as opposed to uh, a road that definitely goes from point A to point B, and, uh, you know. No, any loan has to be extremely explicit. First of all, because the government on the other side doesn't want to borrow for something that's not explicit, and the bank doesn't want to approve something that's not explicit. You want the engineer, you want as much detail as done. So by the time they get the money, they're actually ready to start, that they're actually ready to procure if they haven't procured before. So it's very explicit, but the analysis that goes into that is a transportation strategy. For example, I mean, to build, it's one problem I have with private funding of toll roads, if it's just a section, you have network economies in transport and, and, and infrastructure in general, but roads in particular in transport. One, you don't, the benefits of one road depend on the other road being in place. And you don't want to just rake all the revenues out of that one road and leave the other guy, you know, without a, a paddle. So it's actually very detailed um, in, in very complex ways. As opposed to the, uh, when, once it's planned, the bids go out for specific. Right. Uh, yeah. right. Yeah, you actually have a procurement plan. Before the loan goes to the board to be approved, you have a procurement plan in place, at least for the first year, depending on if it's a large scale thing, for example, a dam, then you better have everything tied up, including environment, social, revenue, all aspects. Very detailed. Do you ever provide loans where there's staggered payments based upon uh, completion of various sections of a contract? Uh, that's a good question. The, the, there is a new form of lending now that's called results-based, pro program for results, that's based on not just the contracts, but more the, the program is moving along. They've done so many kilometers of this, or they put it in so many schools, and then the bank disperses. You have to be careful on this because the country is borrowing the money because they don't have the money to pay. And if you wait till it's, it's over and you've gotten it, and the contractor's not going to want to be pre-investing this thing, he's not going to have the funding to do it. And one of the biggest problems in developing countries is the time, timeliness of payment. Um, but for certain types of investments, that is applied, that you don't get unless they've met a milestone. Um, but you have to be careful about how that, how that runs. I, th I think my time is. Uh, I don't want to shut it. No, no, no last question. Uh, I'll throw one more out. Um, uh, how, in terms of like loan amounts and so forth for the civil you know, type of funding, uh, is there a rule of thumb based on you know I don't know the, the needs of the area or the GNP of how big you know the contract has to be uh, in general for yeah. for like because there's infrastructure that's, that's done privately as well. And, I'm just wondering how granular it has to be or how big the amounts typically are 
per the, the GMP of the yeah, It's actually a more complex question, um, but let me just give you as quick an answer as I can before Bill brushes me off. Um, the, the, the way we do, well, I say we, I still get a pension. Um, the way they do business is you first have a country assistance strategy that covers three to five years. You negotiate with a country to say, what should the strategy be? Where's the economy? Where, what's, who's investing where? Where are the gaps? What's missing? What do you want? What do we want? What are we good at? What are you good at? Um, if the British are doing this or the Japanese doing that, then the bank can do X. Um, and that strategy is on a public consultation basis, a public document that's discussed with civil society and others before it's actually discussed at the board of the bank. And that'll set up the lending program. And then, then you get to how much money is in that program, how much money can a country get. And that is different depending on the level of the economy of the country. You have two levels, you have middle income countries that are okay for non-concessional lending, 18 to 20 year, that's what's called IBRD lending. And they can get various amounts depending what they want to contract. There is a limit based on the bank's financial exposure of how much can go into one single country at a time. But generally, that's open and can all go to one contract or it can go to a lot of different little contracts. Usually they like to spread it around. Um, then you have the low income countries uh, that get concessional lending or actually grants in many cases. That's IDA, that's a different financial deal. It's 40 year money uh, for the poorest at half a percent just service charge. But to make sure that money makes it around the countries, there's a whole process and indicators to tell how much a country can take from that in order not to bankrupt another country that might take that money. So it's a major decision about where these uh, actually go. The amounts, it's very interesting. I mean, I did Nam Tun Dam in Laos, very big dam, several billion dollars. The bank lending was like 20 million. There was a guarantee. There was an environmental, it was very small money from the bank. The private sector was there from Thailand and from uh, France, EDF, Electricité de France. And uh, we were able to leverage. And the reason we were in there was to make sure all the safeguards, the economic analysis, financial analysis was all done correctly and then leveraging and then keeping the Lao, guaranteeing that the Lao would comply. It was a, I can't remember the exact amounts, but it was the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, uh, but then a lot of private sector money came in. So you can get to pretty large numbers. You try to make sure, the bank also has a private sector arm uh, that, is, that can be involved. There are different kinds of guarantees. There's a whole menu of instruments that actually go into to be able to make, because sometimes it's very hard to come up with just the large numbers. But there have been large loans. I mean, Kazakhstan may have been two billion. I don't know, you have this on tape. I'm really scared who's gonna come out here, but um, I think it was two billion dollars for major road construction. Um, it, it varies, so it's middle income country, it's pretty open. A low-income country, fragile state, it's very different. We have one more here? We have two. Uh, how does the World Bank determine who gets money? What country are getting money? Um, okay, it's, uh, you have an income level. Um, basically, it's, it's for low income, and then you have the lowest income, and then that's IDA for concessional lending. And then they, and they're all members. I mean, you have to be a member of the World Bank. So Timor became a new country, it joined the World Bank. Uh, it doesn't pay, it commits amount of money and then it has to pay in, uh, paid in capital is a 7%, 6% of what's callable. Um, often for a country like Timor, another country might pay for it in order to be a member and have a representation at the board. It is truly multilateral. Um, the, uh, then you have the income level for concessional lending and then you have non-concessional lending. Then you have graduation from non-concessional lending. So Korea, in the 1990s was still borrowing from the bank in the early 90s. He graduated, went through the financial crisis at the end of the 1990s, came back to the bank for a loan, emergency loan, and then graduated again. Um, but a lot of countries have come through the bank and graduated, and over time, we're seeing more and more countries graduate from IDA, from concessional to non-concessional, and ultimately to, to the market. Uh, the issue is deciding whether they have access to the market whether their economy is strong enough. You may have some with income per capita that seems relatively high enough to go into uh, non-concessional or even graduate, but they might not have access to uh, the markets for various governance reasons. 
um, that's weighing on them and they're not there. So it's, it's a whole process. I mean, it's, it would take a, a while to explain, but um, there are countries that have been in arrears, for example, like Myanmar, that was not borrowing, the last loan was in the 1990s, and then last year it came back in. Um, you have fragile states that are probably the most difficult and most challenging. But the idea of the bank, the World Bank and the regional banks, is that they take the high risk. They go into places that no one else will go to, that's why they're there. Um, but they have to make sure the money is well used. And, but they have, if the success rate, we measure, we evaluate every project. Every project gets an independent evaluation so you know what's successful, what's not. Then the issue is, okay, where do you target satisfactory? Where, how, where should the institution be as an institution? They generally say 80%. If you're below 80%, then you may be taking on too much risk. If you're above 80%, then you may be not taking enough risk. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I'm simplifying it, but it is, that's Masamayo's where it is. What countries are supporting, financially supporting the World Bank? Oh, they and all. when did this start? Uh, it started, actually, it was for post-war. It was uh, before the Marshall Plan. It was the World Bank that was supposed to be funding, actually doing the Marshall Plan. And then Congress got in, and, and they were able to fund the Marshall Plan. One of the first loans was to Japan, to the Shinkansen, uh, to the bullet trade the bullet in the 50s, in the 1950s. So that came in then. It's grown. It's had capital increases. <clears throat> but the money comes from all the countries, all member countries. Then they go to the market because they have this paid in capital and they have this commitment. I mean, if you screw with the bank, you basically are screwing with 180 countries. It's not a very good thing to do. So basically, the bank goes to the market and you can buy World Bank bonds and invest, and the bank invests. Uh, and that gives you, uh, and it has a AAA rating by its gearing ratio and how well it manages its money. So it's been able to. Part of this yeah. because they're, they're no, doing this, very much a this part of it. Asian bank thing and they're supporting that. I, so that is an issue of voice. I, well, it's, it's a lot of issues, but one of them I think that's been raised, and, and this has been an issue for the emerging economies, was when the bank was set up, the shares are such that um, you know, the OECD countries were pretty much in, uh, had a high share and a representation of the board. Over time, other countries grew, came in. Um, and China was a very big recipient of IDA and actually helps out a lot and been very active at, at the bank. But there is an issue of voice, whether they feel they have enough voice. Brazil, the BRICS bank is, you know, you get Brazil, India, um, yeah, it is the issue. You have the issue of the presidency. Uh, the presidency of the World Bank has always been an American. The IMF has always been a European. The Asian Development Bank always a Japanese. And everyone watches each other when this voice thing came up. The idea was, well, will the next president of the World Bank still be an American? Um, and there was a lot of debate when Jim Kim was elected. The Financial Times actually did an editorial about it about six months ago. And uh, it is hard. I mean, you, you, you know, it's hard for the U.S. in many ways. If the U.S. doesn't have a president, will the Congress still support as much as it might? I mean, it, there's a lot of political questions in this even if you want to do what, what might be the right thing to do, it's, uh, it's a conundrum. But no, they're, they're very much a part of it. And I think there'll be a lot of collaboration between the World Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Bank. And there should be. I'm, for, I'm gonna bring us to a close publicly, but we'll still be around if you have a question that you didn't have a chance to Thank ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been really a great audience. Thank you for, for a very uh, non sexy Illuminating talk. a topic that we needed to, I needed to learn a lot about and did. I don't have a commercial for next week because this is the last talk of this semester, but check our website. Uh, if we have your email, you'll be hearing from us or, or on Twitter or on Facebook, follow us. We'll be announcing our fall and next spring schedules and our scholars. So hope to see you all back then, if not before. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.